to know it got a beautiful thing. American English American English Webinar Series Teach and Learn American English Webinar Series Welcome everyone to our sixth session in the American English Webinar Series 5, brought to you by the American English team at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Let's start our session today with a great photo submitted by a viewing group at the American Corner, America Ordosu, at the Tallis State University in Kyrgyzstan. Here they are pictured viewing Webinar 5.1. We love to see teachers learning together, so please keep sharing your webinar viewing photos by emailing them to AmericanEnglishWebinars at elprograms.org. We may feature them in the next webinar series. I'm Katie Subra, part of the American English team, also known as Moderator Katie S. You'll also see Moderator Heather and Moderator Lauren in the chat box to help you during this webinar will assist you and support you as you participate. Here, you can reflect on the topics that we have covered in Series 5. And as some of you noted in the lobby, um, we're asking again, what webinar was your favorite so far this series? As you know, our webinars are each 60 minutes long and they're often related to a theme found on the American English website. The Teacher's Corner section from the website shown here features resources and lesson ideas related to the month's topic. The theme for March has been about increasing learner engagement. As you know by now, the way for you to participate is by typing in the chat box, as many of you are already doing. The chat box is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. We may not be able to answer every question during the session, as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there is another place to ask questions after the session is over, the Ning Community for Teachers, which we'll look at in more detail momentarily. The presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These multiple choice questions will appear on the screen for you to answer. Some people may experience technical problems during the webinar. We will let you know if we are having a global problem. If you do lose sound, you can follow along with the caption pod at the bottom of the screen if refreshing your internet browser doesn't correct the problem. Participants who attend at least four out of six webinars will receive an e-certificate from the Regional English Language Office or local U.S. Embassy. E-certificates are issued locally several weeks after the series ends today. If you do not receive your e-certificate after approximately six weeks, please first get in touch with your local point of contact in the RELO office or U.S. Embassy. If your query is not resolved, you can then contact American English Webinars at elprograms.org for additional assistance. To ensure you are eligible for the e-certificate, we will ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, you will go to the link that we give you and fill out the requested information. We hope many of you are already Ning community members, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join us. Here you can find resources and discussion questions related to each webinar, as well as all of the webinar recordings and featured materials. The Ning is also where you can ask presenter questions after the webinar and live chat with fellow community members. We are excited to announce the schedule for American English Webinar Series 6, which will begin in five weeks on May 3rd. The first webinar in the series will be about Teacher Talk, 
with the return presenter, Kevin McCoy. During this series, webinars will take place every two weeks from May 3rd through July 12th, and they will be related to the monthly teacher corner themes. Webinars in May will be related to building critical thinking skills theme. Webinars in June will be related to the building global citizens theme. And webinars in July will be related to the STEM and the EFL classroom theme. Even if you participated in the current series, we will need you to register again. So please contact your local regional English language office or US Embassy to register. Please see the Ning announcement in events section for more information. We are looking forward to another great series. And now for today's webinar, Photography in English Language Teaching, Engage, Inspire, Create, Learn. Today we will examine how teachers can utilize the potential of photography as a language learning tool. Our presenter will introduce photography-based activities and lessons for building skills in vocabulary, oral expression, creative writing, community engagement, and more. And she will also introduce strategies for adapting these activities for all levels of English learners and photographers. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Crystal Bach Tyson. Crystal graduated with bachelor's degrees in both photography and Spanish, and she received her master's degree in TESOL from the University of Central Missouri. She taught EFL in Sapporo, Japan for three years and in Luhansk, Ukraine for one year as an English language fellow. She has worked as an English language specialist focusing on training novice EFL teachers and Peace Corps teaching teams. Currently, she is an ESL instructor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And she is a photographer specializing in weddings, portraiture, and travel photography. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you so much, Katie. That was a really nice introduction. And welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to see all of you here from all over the world. Um, before we begin, I wanted to look at some of our lobby polls and get an idea of where we are all coming from and our teaching situations. Um, what category of English language learners do you primarily work with? It looks like the majority are, of you are working with secondary school students, so age 13 to 18. Um, followed up by primary school students and then university students. And then we have a few teaching adults, a few teaching in private language, and a few teaching refugees. So welcome to all of you, no matter what you're teaching. And how often do you take, use, or share personal photographs or images? Most of you said either almost every day, a few times a week, or a few times a month. Less than monthly came in at about 32% and never was the lowest at 10%. So I hope after today you can have some inspiration for taking more pictures in your life. And third poll question, how often do you use photography-based activities in your English language classroom? Many of you said often or whenever you can, which is great at 45%, um, followed by sometimes and the lowest was never at 3%. So I hope once again that you can be inspired after this webinar and you will have more reasons to use these photography-based activities with your students. So before we get into the meat of everything today, I'd like to go over the uh, goals of this webinar. So first of all, we're going to learn about a few basic photography skills and vocabulary terms. We're also going to learn about six photography related activities for the English language classroom or for your English language lesson. We're going to learn about ways that the six presented activities can be modified for different levels, topics, or situations. And we're also going to learn about how other participants in this webinar are using or would like to use photography for language learning. We have a great global community here and I'm very excited to get all of your input today as well. So why use photography in your English classroom? Well, first of all, it's technology with which students are already actively engaging. So many of our students 
students are already taking photos uh, quite often on their mobiles or they're um, looking at photos and imagery on the internet and sharing on social media sites. Um, photography is visual and interactive learning for better language retention. There are many studies that show that visuals help to retain information better than just text alone. Photography helps to stimulate interest among even the quietest of students. So even our shyer students or our students who are reluctant to speak in class can participate and get the benefit of language learning and the language learning activities from these. Uh, more and more image makers or cameras and mobiles are becoming more widely available and accessible than they were in the past. So our students are able to utilize these technologies easier than they could when we were growing up and when we were learning our languages. And finally, the most important one, it's fun. And when you're having fun while learning, you definitely learn better. So let's go to our first poll today. Do you currently have activities that use photography in your own English classroom or in your English lessons? Let's see what we say. So already right away, many of you say yes. A few of you not at all. That's OK. And some of you say a couple. Great. All right. So the majority says yes. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of your ideas in the post discussion today. Um, for those of you that don't have any, I'm hoping to give you some great ideas today. So moving along. So today, uh, as I'm presenting the activities, I'd like you to think about how each one can be adjusted or modified to meet your specific learners needs and classroom situations. Are you working with adults or young children? Is your classroom equipped with technology or not? Do your students have access to technology? What are your specific goals and language outcomes? All of these activities I'm going to present to you can be widely adjusted. So even though I might show examples from my intermediate or advanced university level students, I'd like you to imagine how your own related specific assignment or activity might look like. As teachers, we are masters at adaptation. So this is one of our uh, goals when we are presented with new ideas is how do we take them and make them our own. I'd also like to mention to you all that using photographs, especially when your students are taking their own photos, presents a good opportunity to talk to them about getting permission to both take and use photos, as well as to talk about when taking or using a particular photo may be inappropriate. Uh, photographing people in particular places may be especially sensitive, so please make sure and have this dialogue with your students before getting started. All right, so many of our students and even many of us are familiar with doing selfies. So I'd like you to raise your hand. You can click on the little icon with the hand up. Are you familiar with this English term selfie? OK, I see many of you are. It's one of the most popular English terms nowadays. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, a selfie is a photo you take of yourself and sometimes with others as well. So you can see examples of some of my students enjoying their selfies. Before I begin any of the activities I'm going to present to you today, I always try to pre-teach some basic photography vocabulary and have the students try out these terms on their phones or cameras in the classroom as I go over them. If your students are allowed to have their mobiles in class, you can do this as well. If they're not, it could be a homework assignment or you don't even have to focus on these at all. OK, so these are some of the items that I start out with with my students with composition and lighting. Composition, of course, means the arrangement of items within an image. So hopping over to our poll number two. I'd like you all to check all that apply. How many of these photography terms are you familiar with? So some of them might be very familiar to you. Some of them might be completely new and some of them might be vaguely familiar. So it looks like uh, perspective 
and portraits. We have quite a few. Uh, let's see, some framing, yes. So perspective, portraits. Rule of thirds, interesting, not very many. We don't have any with open shade or harsh light, just a few. Okay, portrait seems to be the number one phrase we're familiar with here. Okay, great. Uh, let's go back into our presentation then. So one photo trick that's especially helpful in getting better photographs and one that I like to teach right away with my students is called the rule of thirds. I don't have time to teach you all of these today, but I will give you some resources so that you can find out more about them. But I will teach you about the rule of thirds. So let's first of all look at this nice photo I took of a gentleman in Japan. This is a very pleasing and interesting photo to look at. And it is mainly because I have used the rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds states that if you are taking a mat an image, you should imagine a grid while you're taking the photo. Within this grid, you should try to place your subject on one of the four points where the grids intersect. So in one of the areas where the red circles are. This is a rule that every photographer knows and 80% or even more of the most beautiful or interesting photos that you have seen follow this rule. So I'd like to encourage you to try it for yourself the next time you're taking photos. It's an easy one to teach and an easy one to learn, but sometimes a hard one to practice and remember. So this can also be used when you turn your phone or camera the other way. So some of you have this grid automatically on your phones, on your image makers. But if you don't, that's okay. You just have to imagine it and place your subject in one of those areas. There are many websites that will teach you basic photography skills if you're not familiar with the ones listed here. Of course, I have an extensive background with this, so it's easy for me to teach. But if not, uh, you can check some of these out. Two that I really like are at Lifehacker and Petapixel. And the links to these can be found on our webinar link, excuse me. So make sure to check those out. Also sites like National Geographic Kids are also good places to start for photography examples and activities with simple English. Depending on the level of your students, you may want to limit the amount of terms or skills that you teach. And you don't even have to teach these at all, depending on your goals. But I always recommend that you play around with these and learn about them before teaching them to your students. You might even become, find a hidden talent and become a photographer yourself. Okay, let's, so let's move on to our first activity. Our first activity is a vocabulary or thematic scavenger hunt. So I'd like you all to raise your hand if you've ever done a scavenger hunt with your students. If you know what that is, raise your hand. So a scavenger hunt is a type of game where participants are given a list of tasks to complete or to find. Okay, so quite a few of you have done this before. So for the photo version, the students really receive a list of items that they have to take photos of with their cameras. Okay, so after I have taught my students a little presentation on basic photography skills, I then have them do a scavenger hunt on these skills. So I, here's an example of the activity I give them. They have 13 tasks they have to take pictures of using the different skills that we learned about in class. And on the back of this handout, they have some reminders for some of the photography terms that we learned or that may be new for them. And this particular handout is also available on the Ning for you to access if you'd like. You can even modify it to your own needs. Here it is again. I worked with some high school students in Ukraine. You can see we didn't have any technology in our classroom except for my small laptop and I was still able to teach them some of the skills and they then I modified the scavenger hunt for their level. So you can see it's quite a bit simpler and with fewer tasks. 
but the students were working together in pairs to complete these um, tasks in English together. And then afterwards they shared their photos. I did this also in Japan with my students with their point and shoot cameras and some of the instructors also joined in as well. So it's a lot of fun for all ages and all levels. Of course, the learning objectives from this activity are English listening skills if you give a presentation beforehand, following directions in English, improved basic photo skills if that is the scavenger hunt theme you choose. Remember, you do not have to choose to teach your students photo skills, only if you want to. Uh, creative thinking and, of course, working together. So students can uh, work together by using their native language or in the target language, depending on your goals. But the scavenger hunt itself will be in English. OK, so some more scavenger hunt ideas. Of course, I gave you basic photo skills already. You could also have students go out and find particular vocabulary words from your unit or chapter. Maybe they could go out and take pictures uh, that they feel represent particular words, such as uh, happiness or cozy, etc. You could have students go out and work on adjectives and descriptions. Take a picture of something blue, something red, something cheerful, something gloomy or sad something wonderful, and then they can bring those back and describe why they use the photos to represent those particular adjectives. You can also have students do a scavenger hunt to find different sites around your school or your neighborhood or even your town. And I call this the selfie hunt. So here in Lincoln, Nebraska, in the United States, we have many students from all over the world that come to us and many of them are unfamiliar with our town. So I made a selfie hunt for them where they can go and take a selfie at the different places. And in the meantime, they get to know Lincoln and what's available to them as far as restaurants and coffee shops and parks and places to hang out. So let's zoom in on that Lincoln selfie hunt a bit. So as you can see, I've kind of divided it up by area and I, for each entry, I give a suggestion of what students could do at the particular place. I give the name of the place and I give the address. So if they have a phone, they can look it up on their phone, the address. If not, if it's within their own city, you could give them landmarks or street corners or intersections for them to go and find to show that they were there. And afterwards, I have students upload their selfie photos to an album of their choice, an online album. So the student on the left has used Google, uh, Google Docs, and the student on the right has used her Facebook, I believe. So they upload their photos there to show how many they completed. And then you can do anything with this afterwards. You can uh, share have the students share their experience on a video so they can talk about what they saw, what they did, um, what was surprising to them, what was new for them. You can have students do a writing assignment with this. Maybe they write a short essay or maybe they make a brochure to advertise their city to other students. Um, the possibilities are endless with this and it's a great way to get students out and about and then give them a follow up activity to do. Okay, so our activity two is a storytelling activity. So in this activity, students will take a photo from their own world and write about it. And the photos and the writings can be electronically shared or they can be printed and put on display. So making content personal helps us increase engagement merely because our own lives are more interesting to us. So students most favorite thing to talk about is, of course, their own lives and themselves, especially teenagers. So having students use their own photos from their world as both writing prompts and illustrations is an interesting way for them to share a little bit about themselves with the class. So here's another example from one of my students. He visited a music festival here in Nebraska and wrote about it his first time. So the learning objectives with this 
Students can work on sequencing and storytelling. So sequencing is putting things in order and using transitions and connectors to make a story. Of course, it works on writing skills and grammar skills. You can pair this with your specific units, such as simple past, past perfect, past progressive, anything you're working on in your class. And of course, this connects content to students' personal lives and interests. So they can take what they've learned from you in class and actually apply it to something they've experienced and demonstrate with their own photo. So some additional activities you can do with this example. Students can swap or exchange photos and create stories for their classmates' photos. That's always pretty fun and interesting to see what they come up with. Uh, if you do this activity, I would suggest letting your students know in advance that they will be uh, exchanging photos. That way they don't bring in a sensitive photo or a photo that they don't want anyone else to write about or make a story about. Photos can be passed around with a sheet of paper and each student writes a sentence building a story. And I actually have a handout that shows how to do that. So in this situation, you would tape the student's photo at the top and then pass the paper around the class. And each person who gets this paper will fill in one line of the story based on the prompt. This is act, uh, yes, this is also another activity handout that you can find on our name. So you can download it and change it as you need. Okay. This is a great activity for teaching and writing poetry or for illustrating poetry. So if you are learning a poem in class and you can have the students use their own images to illustrate it or to give more meaning to it. And then, of course, if you have lower levels, they can merely use their photos to work on adjectives or even sentence building in English. Once again, connecting the abstract language to their own personal interests. Okay, so moving on to activity three. Activity three is what I call a day in the life photo essays. So students make photographs during a typical day in the life of, and they choose because we have many different lives that we are a part of. So they can choose a day in the life of an international student in the USA, a day in the life of an English learner, a day in the life of a singer, etc. Because we all have different lives or aspects of ourselves that we could demonstrate, you really could choose from many different ideas and make this photo essay very creative. So I'd like to get some more ideas from you all in the chat box. What other type of person or life could your students feature in their day in the life of photo essay? So go ahead and write in the chat box there what you think your students might choose to illustrate in their day of the life of. Day in the life of a son or a daughter. Sure, a day in the life in the village. Excellent, I love that. A day in the life of a particular sports player. Okay. Yes, farming is very interesting. Lots of different things they could illustrate. Day in the life of their parents. They had to follow their parents a lot around, could be interesting. The day in the life of a doctor or teacher, definitely. Lots of good ideas here. So you're coming up with really interesting ideas and your students definitely will do the same. They're so creative. So as you all said, there's other ideas for this. Students could write about a daily, their daily routines or their daily habits or their daily practices from waking up in the morning and having breakfast to having dinner at night. They can write about their school life, their classes. They can write about their friends and what they do outside of school when they're not um, having to study. And they can write about family and home life. And I still see many, many different ideas in the chat box. They're all fantastic. So here's another day in the life photo essay. And some learning objectives, of course. Once again, we have storytelling and sequencing, which are always good for students to practice their language. 
Students can work on oral or written ex expression in English, so you can have them verbally talk about their essay, or you can have them write the story for their essay. And then, of course, sharing and understanding perspectives. That's one of the reasons why we learn another language, in order to understand difference, differences in different people. And sharing these photo essays in class will give everyone a different perspective on some of their classmates, which is always good. Okay, so a few additional activities you can do with this. I like to use this with electronic pen pals from other parts of the country or from other students' classes on campus if you're at a large campus or even from other countries. So when I teach abroad, I try to connect with another teacher back here in the United States and we set up electronic pen pals. So my students will put together a photo essay, a day in the life of, and then they will write about it and then we will send them by email to our electronic pen pals. And they will do the same for us. So it's a great way to start conversation, to learn about other parts of the world and other people, and really to promote that human, that human connection that we all know exists. Uh, so how-to photo essays are also a good idea to do with this. Students would photograph the steps to do something, so how to cook a particular recipe, how to study for a test, how to use a social media site. So the students would have to think about each step of those things that usually come naturally for them, and they have to photograph them and then talk about them or write about them. So really, you can do many, many different things with this. So we already heard about some ideas of how you could have your students show their different uh, lives through a day in the life of. Do you have any ideas of what else students could show on a how-to photo essay? Let's go to the chat box and see how to play the piano. Very great. Okay, yes, it can be used to promote tourism, especially of your hometown. How to drive a car if you have older students. Or maybe you have younger students who want to talk about how they think you should drive a car. <laughs> how to draw something, how to plan a trip, great. How to use Instagram, maybe some of our students can teach us something through these essays. How to read Arabic, yes, why not bring in their, their other languages? Great idea, I love that. How to have fun, <laughs> that's something that we all could use a reminder of every once in a while. These are excellent ideas and I'm looking forward to hearing more of these ideas in the post discussion on our name. All right, moving right along to activity four. These are personal vocabulary albums. So students will take photos to help them remember vocabulary words and then they will store them in albums on their phones, online, or in a Word document to study. So they kind of look a little something like this, although you can change them as you see fit. And the learning, learning objective with this is that students will have better retention of vocabulary words through their own personal visuals. So instead of memorizing a list of abstract words, students can now connect those vocabulary words to their own image that they feel represents the meaning of the word. And this is when they're thinking about vocabulary and building it, having that visual in their mind as the connector will really help to improve their vocabulary. Let's zoom into this particular document. So you can see I have this arranged by units. So the first entry would be the student's photo, their own photo. Secondly, they would have the vocabulary word from the chapter or from the unit. They would give a simple definition in English and a simple example of how to use that particular word. So when they're studying, that visual comes up in their mind. So there are many free online storage albums that students can use for these photos if they have access to a mobile or a digital camera. And here are a few right now, but you probably have some others that are very popular in your country. I know Instagram is popular right now in the United States. There might be some that you are more familiar with. Um, so if you use this method, students can title each photo as a vocabulary word 
and then they can upload them into albums that are titled the unit or the chapter name or number. So for example, chapter five vocabulary can be a folder and then the students can upload these images into that folder. What they then have is their own personal uh, vocabulary study guide that they can flip through if they have a smartphone or, or a computer. It's a better way to study. And really, I think you're going to see that the students are going to do better on their vocabulary tests. Now, you uh, might not be able to do this all the time and for every unit, but you might try it for some. And I see in the chat box, yes, there are some good ideas. There are some apps that actually will do this for you. Um, if you don't want to download an app or purchase an app, the free photo albums are also a way to go. OK, everyone. So I've got a major chat box participation activity for you right here. You have 20 seconds. I'd like you to type as many adjectives about the next photo as you possibly can. Ready? Three, two, one, go. So 10 seconds left. Great, look at these adjectives. Three, two, one, time is up. How many adjectives did you type? How many did you get before the end of the 20 seconds? <laughs> They're still going. It's hard to cut them off. We love our adjectives. Okay, so this is an activity I like to do often on Monday mornings for a warm up. What I usually do, I tell my students they have one minute and they have to work together with a partner. They have to say and write as many adjectives about the photo as they possibly can. I call this activity the adjective scramble. Scramble because the students are scrambling or hurrying to write and think about as many things as they can within one minute. So for the activity, I usually show what I call an active or a very interesting photo. So a photo that kind of has a lot happening in it. And then the students and partners will list adjectives in pairs as the warm up. So after they share their adjectives, I have, well, actually, I have them count up their adjectives first and shout them out the number. And the group or the pair that has the most adjectives will get, then get to read off their adjectives so other students can listen. And if they have any that the winning group did not have, they can also share those as well. So after doing that, you could use this photo then as a conversation prompt or a writing prompt if you wanted to continue the warm up. Okay, here's a picture in one of my smaller classes doing the adjective scramble warm up on a Monday morning. So the learning objectives for this, it, you can review acquired adjectives. So students kind of have to dig in a bit into their brains and remember some of the adjectives maybe they haven't learned in a while or use some of the adjectives that they've learned right away. Uh, this is definitely a learner-centered oral warm-up. So students are very engaged because it's fast and it's competitive. And then students also are able to build confidence through sharing opportunities, which I'm going to talk about here in just a bit. Okay. So like I said, you can ask follow up questions about the photo to stimulate discussion amongst the students. What I like to do is I like to give each student their own week to share the photo that they choose and to be the teacher for the warm up. So the students get to participate, they get to present, but they know exactly what they need to say and do. So they'll come to the front, they'll say, OK, students, you have one minute to write as many adjectives as you can. And then afterwards, they'll lead their classmates in a discussion. Where do you think this is? What do you think the people are doing? Who do you think this is and why is this person doing this? So it's kind of a fun little activity for them to do and they get excited when their week is coming up to try to find the best photo. Now, if you don't have a projector in your classroom, students can also bring in small photos and pass them around. You could break them up into smaller groups and have simultaneous groups going at the same time. 
They could bring in photos from magazines or old calendars, or you could uh, keep a stack of old calendars in your office, just rip up, rip them up and save the photos or some beautiful imagery to use. So there's always ways to adapt this for your situation. Okay. Also making competitions for the most unique adjectives, descriptions, or the most interesting story, either verbally or orally is always a lot of fun to do for students. Okay. So, once again, having this as a prompt for a quick descriptive writing warm up or an oral warm up is is always a good one. And I like to do this. I do this almost every Monday in my speaking and listening class, but I've also done this for writing classes. So I've been able to modify this according to my class. All right. So I'd like to go to the last activity, which is blogging. And before we do that, I'd like to go to our poll number three, which is. How often do you read or write a blog? And if you're not sure what a blog even is, go ahead and answer that as well. Okay, so it looks like many of you rarely to never. Sometimes we read blogs and we're not even sure that they are blogs at the time we're reading them. Okay, a few of you, mostly every day, just a few. Some, some of you a few times a week, a few times a month. Okay, but the majority still rarely to never. Okay, that's okay. Um, blogging is one of my favorite activities to do with my students. And I'll give you some of the um, reasons why, and I'll also show you a bit more about how you can set up blogs and how you can go about incorporating them into your classroom. So let's go on back to the presentation here. So when we're talking about a blog, what is a blog exactly? It's actually a combination of two words put together, a web log. So we've smushed those together and come up with the word blog. So a web log is basically an online journal. So you would be creating your own blog website and on that website, you would have your own journal posts or entries. So I have all my writing students create a blog, regardless of their level. They have weekly topics on which to write, and they share the links to their blog posts with me as they're due. By the end of the semester or by the end of the year, they have full blog website with a collection of their weekly writings. So it's definitely like an online writing portfolio, and the students can go back, and even I could go back and monitor their progress throughout the semester, throughout the year. Okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a blog versus a blog post because it can be a little bit confusing and these are things you would have to teach to your students if you decide to use this activity. So when we're talking about a blog, a blog is the overall website you create or the overall website that each of your students creates. So I'd like you to think of it like, a, a, like an empty journal notebook. The blog has a large title, usually at the top, and when you click on the title, you can see all of the blog posts that were published there. The blog contains links to all your published posts, as I said. And the blog can be customized with your choice of backgrounds, colors, photos, and information. So how is a blog post different from a blog? A blog post is an individual entry on the blog website. So I had you imagine that the blog was like a journal notebook. So a blog post is like your daily or weekly entry in that journal notebook. So a blog post has a smaller title. And when you click on this title, then you only see that full post or that full journal entry. And then the blog post is created inside of your blog. So you would click on new post to add a post to your blog. So a common mistake that students make and even sometimes teachers make is to create a whole new blog web page for each, each post instead of a whole new post in one blog. So basically there should be one 
web address under which all the posts are contained. Sounds a little confusing, but I will show you an example. So we have this example of a blog, and it's actually called example of a blog. And you can find this at examplofablog.com. So it's very handy for kind of learning a little more about blogging. So this is how a blog looks. At the top in the blue, we have our blog title. If I click on that blue blog title, I will get to see all of the blog posts within this blog. So you can imagine these as the weekly or the daily entries that one person has written. So let's say I would like to read more about the six classics, the best short stories for teenagers right here. So if I click on that one title, I can read the full post. Now you can see at the top, we've got the blog name. So if I click back on that, I will get to see all of the posts once again. Okay, so here we've got the best short stories for teenagers and somebody has written a post. They've even put a video in there. I like to encourage that students put in their own photos and you could also have them put in videos. You could have them put in infographics. You can have them link to other sources or other websites, you know, it's up to you. It's however you create this. There are a variety of free blogging websites out there. I would say right now, maybe the most popular would be Blogger just because it is the Google platform. So if you're, you or your students have a Gmail account or a YouTube account or a Google Docs account, this you would use the same username and password for Blogger. So you already have a Blogger account if you have those. Some other ones are wordpress.com, tumblr.com, probably are, there are numerous ones. There may be some in, in your own country that are quite popular. You just have to search around for them, but they are free, okay? When you're talking about setting up a blog with your students, you do wanna address privacy and security for them, especially if they're younger. On a blog, you have three privacy settings. You have private, which means only the student or only the author can view the blog and the posts. You have unlisted. This is the one I encourage my students to use. Only people with whom the student shares the link can view the blog and the blog post. So this is a really good option for your students because they will then share their links with you. And then of course, public means anyone in the World Wide Web can view it. So I try to discourage them from that. I do have a few students who just don't mind and want to go public, but I do encourage them to go with unlisted. So make sure you talk about this with your students. It's a very important aspect of our online world. So here's an example of a handout I created for one of my more advanced writing classes. And this is going to be available on our Ning. You can take it, modify it, chop it up, change it how you need or want for your own students or your own class. So if I zoom in, in a bit, um, I tell the students that they will be responsible for creating a blog. I give them some ideas of where they could go. And I tell them how to follow, follow the instructions. The great thing is nowadays, most of our students are digital natives. If you tell them to go set up a blog and you give them some basic information, such as the difference between a blog and a post and some information on security, they can basically go in and, and just they're whizzes at this. They can just do this. It kind of comes naturally for them. The other part is I tell them that they will have a weekly topic and I tell them my word minimum count for each entry. So that would change according to your students and what you would like them to be required of in their class. I always have students illustrate their blogs with their own personal photos. So I do discourage taking photos off the internet. If you don't mind that, that would be a good time to talk to, talk to your students about uh, citing and showing where they sourced their photos from and giving credit where the credit is due. All right. So you can see at the bottom it says, after you've posted your weekly writing assignment to the web, copy and paste the URL for that blog post only. So I ask them to copy the web address for each post 
and then paste that into our discussion board on Canvas. We have a discussion we learn a we have a discussion board that we use on a learning management system for our school. If you do not have this, that's okay. You can have students send you their links each week by email and then you can store those in a folder. The great thing about blogging is you don't have to use any class time for this. This can be in, done entirely on students' own time and it's especially helpful if they have access to a computer or a computer lab. Okay. So here's some other examples of a few of my students' blogs. Some of them are more creative than others with their blog titles. But the learning objectives here are academic and evaluative writing. If you want to um, do this with your, your more advanced learners, uh, we do a lot of reading in our writing class and the, I have the students evaluate the readings and answer particular questions on critical thinking. Of course, students can express opinions with both writing and imagery, their own imagery. They can, use, they can work on descriptive writing about their own personal photos. They can work on particular grammar or adjective use in context. So if you've worked on something in class and you want to have them demonstrate that they've understood that, they can do so on their blog. And then, of course, web publishing and blogging are great skills for our students to know how to do. Many, many, many businesses nowadays have their own blog. And this is another skill that students can add to their um, to their criteria for a job later on. So it gives them great experience in that world. Okay, some bl possible blog topics. Well, in the chat box, how about you all? What do you think? What are some possible blog topics that your students could write about? So all of you have particular units or topics that you're doing with your students. Um, let's go to the chat box and see what you think about. Yes, storytelling, hobbies, pollution or uh, situations in our own country. Great. Sports, mm -hmm. some Global, uh, we see how to stop terrorism or some global concerns, getting students to think about that. Culture, food, wonderful. The university you want to attend and why, great. There's all kinds, social media, poetry. This really can be tied to almost anything in your curriculum and that's why I love blogging. And I also especially love it because it doesn't take up any of our precious class time. We, we, we as teachers have very limited time. So blogging is a great side tool. And the students especially get to spend so much time with their blog that it does become a personal uh, important part of them and they, they like to go there. So I do encourage you to encourage your students to make their blog a very personalized space. Tell them to personalize it with their own photos, their own backgrounds, colors. It should be a space where they'll want to go and hang out and where they feel a strong personal connection. So it is kind of like their own journal. And these free blogging platforms really allow for students to customize in many different ways. So encourage them with that. Lots of great examples here in the chat box. So um, once again, you can take it and use it how you need in your classroom. Here I have topics related to the textbook or class unit holidays or cultural events in their own country or in other countries that they're learning about. They could write about museums, attractions, places around town. You can combine it with the selfie hunt if you decided to do that. They could write about their food music favorites. They could write about the how-to directions or a day in the life of activity from activity five. So just it's endless the, the amounts of activities that they could do. Okay, so um, we have a few minutes for questions, but first of all, I'd like to go to our last poll today and kind of see which of the activities presented do you think you might be able to try out with your students? I see a lot with the storytelling, excellent. Um, many, many like the scavenger hunts, those are always a ton of fun. A few the day in the life of or the how-to, not too many on the blogging. Um, it might be something that's a little bit more intimidating. Lots on the storytelling, great. A few on the personal vocabulary albums, wonderful. So on the blogging, because it's um, not as many 
feel that they'd like to try that out. I would encourage you as a teacher to set up your own blog, keep your own blog for a while um, and see how it goes. That's the best way to learn and the best way to teach. So keep a weekly blog, make it your own personal space and it'll be easier to teach when the time comes. So there have been a couple of questions about assessing these activities. How do we assess these activities? Um, it really depends on you and your classroom goals. I often use a rubric. I make my own rubric for some of these activities. Uh, sometimes I grade them, I give them just a completion grade. So if they did the minimum requirements and they did them successfully, I'll give them a completion grade. Um, I, almost, I never grade on their actual photos. I always grade on the language outcomes or the language goals. Um, so you would decide for your own class how and what you'd actually want to grade, but rubrics are always a, a, a popular option and then you can make your own criterion for that. Um, once again, as far as photos go, it's such a personalized medium that it's really hard to assess that unless they are taking a specific photography class, which I think um, wouldn't be the case in most of our situations. So we have just a few minutes left and I'd like to let you all know that we do have our webinar Ning and on this Ning you can find all kinds of resources. You can find readings related to this topic you can find all of the handouts that I've created. You can download them and change them and modify them how you want. Uh, you can find a post webinar discussion that we'd like you to join with your other questions. We'd like you to give us your own examples or your own ideas for assessments. And we can, and there's also some links to some websites that I've suggested, especially some that teach you how to learn a few more basic photography skills. So we really hope that you will hop over and to our Ning and, and check it out and just continue the discussion and continue to learn. So there's so much you can do with photography and unfortunately we don't have the most time in the world to go over everything, but I thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal, for sharing those excellent ideas for using photography in the English language classroom. You provided some great resources and strategies that we can all use to engage and inspire our students. We also look forward to the post-webinar discussion and in, to exploring your resources further on the Ning. Uh, we'd also like to thank you, our audience, for your active participation today. We look forward to learning with you again during Series 6, which will begin on May 3rd. Be sure to register with your RELO or local U.S. Embassy if you are interested. Information about registering will be available on the Ning.